This is part two of a review of exponential and logarithmic functions. If you haven't seen part one, you can either click the link that appears in the upper right hand corner or find the link in the description. This is AP Precalculus topic 2.9 through 2.15. On the AP Precalculus exam, there will be four free response questions. In this video, we will do a word problem similar to what you might see on FRQ 2, and we will do several equations like you might find on FRQ 4. If you appreciate this content, please give it a like. Number 17. Students who completed a class participated in a year-long study to see how much content from the class they retained over the following year. At the end of the class, students completed an initial test to determine the group's content knowledge. At that time, t equals zero, the group of students achieved a score of 75 out of 100 points. For the next 12 months, the group was evaluated at the end of each month to track their retention of the content. After three months, t equals three, the group's score was 70.84 points. The group score can be modeled by the function r, given by r of t equals a plus b natural log of t plus one, where r of t is the score in points for month t, and t is the number of months since the initial test. A part one, use the data to write two equations that can be used to find the values for constants a and b in the expression for r of t. Every input output pair can be used to write an equation. For example, if we plug in an input value of zero, it should equal the output value of 75. So that gives us the equation a plus b times the natural log of zero plus one is equal to 75. Similarly, the input output pair t equals three and 70.84 gives us the equation a plus b natural log of three plus one is equal to 70.84. A part two, find the values of A and B. Notice that we cannot use the regression capabilities of the calculator to find the values of A and B because this is natural log T plus one. If this were just the natural log of T, we could just plug the input output pairs into L1 and L2 on the calculator and find a regression model. But with the extra plus one here, we have to do most of this by hand. So let's start with the first equation, where we have a plus b natural log one is equal to 75. The natural log of one is zero. So this term is zero, and we just have a is equal to 75. That was easy, so we have one value done. Now we need to find b using the other equation. So we have, well, I started to say a plus b natural log four, but we now know that a is 75. So let's go ahead and write 75 plus b natural log four is equal to 70.84. Subtracting 75 from both sides, gives us negative 4.16. So now we have this. To get the value of b, we need to divide both sides of the equation by the natural log of four. So b will equal negative 4.16 divided by the natural log of four. Let's put this into the calculator. Always make a vertical fraction you can hit alpha y equals enter, or if your software is up to date, you can just hit alpha x. So we need negative 4.16 divided by the natural log of four. So that's the value of b. 
This is very close to negative 3, but um, if we need this later, we're going to need even these decimals on the end. So let's store all of these decimals into letter B on the calculator by immediately hitting store and then alpha B. Um, while we're at it, even though 75 is a really easy number to write, let's store 75 into letter A as well. Uh, so we're going to do 75 and then store and then alpha A. I'm going back to the paper to record the value of B now. Let me mention to you that the College Board will accept three decimal places, um, in which case we could just write negative three. However, um, some students try to round to three decimal places and they end up losing a point because they round wrong. So my recommendation is always use four decimal places and don't try to round. So that's why I'm going to write negative 3.0008. Let's move on to part B. B part one, use the given data to find the average rate of change of the scores in points per month from t equals zero to t equals three months. Express your answer as a decimal approximation. Show the computations that lead to your answer. Remember that the score is given by this function r of t, so I'm going to use that. On the interval from 0 to 3, the average rate of change will be given by r at 3 minus r at 0 divided by 3 minus 0. We were told that r at 3 is 70.84 and r at 0 is 75. So this is the average rate of change. Let's type this into the calculator. Again, I'm going to record four decimal places and I am not going to round. I suggest you do the same. The average rate of change is negative 1.3866 points per month. Don't forget the units. B part two. Interpret the meaning of your answer from part one in the context of the problem. Start with the meaning of the function itself, which is the group's score. Be sure to mention the unit, so I'm going to say the group's score in points. Then you want to say if the value is increasing or decreasing. If the average rate of change is positive, we're going to say that this value is increasing. If the average rate of change is negative, we're going to say that this value is decreasing. The group's score in points is decreasing by 1.3866 points per month on average. Now, don't stop there. So far, we have not earned the point. You must mention the interval on which the average rate of change was calculated. So we're going to say from t equals zero to t equals three months. And be sure to say on average in there. And use good grammar. I should have put an apostrophe right here, the group's score. Be careful. Notice that even though the average rate of change is negative, I did not say negative 1.3866 right here. The reason is that the negative is indicated by the word decreasing. Decreasing by 1.3866. If you say decreasing by negative 1.3866, you will lose the point. Decreasing by negative would actually mean increasing. B part three. Consider the average rates of change of R from t equals three to t equals p months, where p is greater than three. Are these average rates of change less than or greater than the average rate of change from zero to three months found in part i? Explain your reasoning. Let's start by writing the equation for r with a and b filled in. A graph of this model will help us find the answer and justification. 
So let's put this as y1 in the graphing calculator and take a look at the graph. Because we stored the values of a and b into letters a and b on the calculator, for y1 we can really write a plus b natural log x plus 1, where we uh, type the a and b by hitting alpha a and alpha b. Having a 75 in the front is the same as adding 75 on the end. This is a vertical translation by 75. For that reason, we're going to have to adjust the window. This R of T graph is going to be very big. I'm going to let X max be 100, and I'm going to let Y max be 100. Let's take a look. So the graph is looking like this. I recommend that you include a sketch of the graph in your answer to increase the probability of earning this point. The important aspect is that R of T is concave up. Therefore, the rate of change is increasing. So far we have R of T is equal to this expression, which is concave up for T greater than zero. So the average rates of change are increasing. Therefore, the average rates of change from t equals 3 to t equals p months are greater than the average rate of change from t equals 0 to t equals 3 months. By the way, here's how you know what the graph of r of t looks like, even without checking it on the graphing calculator. The parent function natural log t looks like this. Uh, I'm rounding to negative 3 here. The b value of negative 3 is going to cause a reflection over the x-axis. So it goes from looking like this to looking like this. This is the key part which allows us to answer the question. But uh, also, because of the vertical shift by 75, I'm going to raise this graph up higher. And because of the horizontal translation by negative 1, uh, this is going to shift over and touch the y-axis. So you could figure out that the graph of R of T will look like this without the graphing calculator. Part C. The leaders of the study decide to use the model R to make predictions about the group score beyond 12 months, one year. For a given year, model R is an appropriate model if the group's predicted score at the end of the year is at least one point lower than the group's predicted score at the end of the previous year. Based on this information, for how many years is model R an appropriate model? Give a reason for your answer. Note, the end of a year occurs every 12 months from the initial evaluation. So that's t equals 12, t equals 24, and so on. Let's make a chart showing the group's score at the end of each year so we can see if the score is at least one point lower than the previous year. We can use our graphing calculator to do this very efficiently since we have stored R of T as Y1 in the calculator. So here's R of T. It's crucial that we stored the full values of A and B into letters A and B in the calculator. That way we're not losing any accuracy by using rounded numbers. In order to evaluate R of T at multiple values efficiently, I want you to change one setting in your calculator. Uh, hit second window to get at the table setup. Right now on your calculator, you probably have this independent set to auto, but I want you to switch it over to ask like this. Then hit second graph to take a look at the table. I'm just going to delete these values that are here. The table will now give us the output value for any input value we type in. So we want to evaluate R of T at 12 and 24 and 36 and 48. We can do more if we need to. Let's record these values uh, back in our work. You know what? We should include year zero on this chart. 
This way we can show that the initial group score was 75. Now, the question is, does the group score fall by at least one point at the end of every year? From 75 to 67.3, that's clearly a drop of more than one. From 67.3 to 65.3, again, another drop of greater than one. So, so far that's yes and another yes. What about from 65.3 to 64.1? Well, that's still a drop of greater than one. From 65.3, a drop of one would be 64.3. So 64.1 is less than that. So more than a drop of one. But what about from 64.1 to 63.3? This is not a drop of one. From 64.1 to 63.1 would be a drop of one, but this is not that low. That means year three is the last year when the model was still appropriate. R of T is an appropriate model for three years because the end of year three is the last year with a group score at least one point lower than the previous year. By the way, including this chart is part of your answer. Solve the following equations. Show all work and be sure to check for extraneous solutions. That's apparent solutions that don't actually work when you plug them back in. The graph of a log parent function looks like this, whether it's base 10 or base 3 or what have you. So the domain is from 0 to infinity, not including 0 itself. For that reason, in a problem like number 21, if you got a solution of x equals 2, this would be an extraneous solution. Because if you plug x equals 2 in right here, that would give you 2 minus 4, which would give you a negative 2. So now you're doing the log base 10 of a negative number. That's outside of the domain. This would be undefined. To solve number 18, ultimately we need x to be by itself. We can make the log base 10 part go away by dropping a base 10 on both sides of the equation. On the left side, the base 10 and the log base 10 will cancel each other out, leaving behind x minus 1 equals. And then on the right hand side, we have 10 squared, which is 100. Subtracting, uh, or rather adding 1 to both sides, gives us x is equal to 101. And uh, this is not extraneous. If we plug in 101 right here, um, we do not get a negative number or zero. Looking at number 19, our first move is going to be dividing both sides by four. That will leave us with log base three of two x is equal to two. We need to get the x by itself eventually, but we can make the log base 3 part go away by dropping a base 3 on both sides of the equation. On the left side, the 3 and the log base 3 cancel each other out, leaving 2x. 2x is equal to 3 squared, which is 9. Dividing both sides by 2 gives us x is equal to 9 over 2. Looking at number 20, our first step is going to be subtracting 4 from both sides. So that will leave us with the natural log of x over 3 is equal to 3. We can make the ln go away by dropping a base e on both sides of the equation. We know that natural log is really log base e. So the base e and the natural log will cancel each other out. And on the left side, we will be left with x over 3. So that's x over 3 is equal to e to the third power. Multiplying both sides of the equation by 3 
gives us x is equal to 3e to the third power. On number 21, we will use the properties of logarithms to simplify the left-hand side. The difference of two logs can be written as the single log of a quotient. In this case, log base 10 of x over 3. So we have log base 10 of x over 3 is equal to log base 10 of x minus 4. We can make the log base 10 part go away by dropping a base 10 on both sides of the equation. On both sides, the 10 and the log base 10 will cancel each other out, leaving behind x over 3 is equal to x minus 4. I'm not enjoying this fraction, so let's multiply both sides of the equation by 3 to make the fraction sort of go away. So then we will have x is equal to 3x minus 12. Now let's subtract 3x from both sides. That's going to leave us with negative 2x is equal to negative 12. Dividing both sides by negative 2 leaves us with x is equal to 6. On number 22, we will again use properties of logarithms to simplify the left-hand side of the equation. The sum of two logs can be written as the single log of a product. In this case, the natural log of x plus 2 times x minus 1. And that will equal the natural log of 3x plus 13. So I'm going to do two things at once on the next step. To make the ln go away, I can drop a base e on both sides of the equation. So the ln will be gone on both sides. But let's go ahead and multiply x plus 2 times x minus 1. Uh, we're going to foil this out. So this is going to be x squared. Inner we have 2x, outer we have negative x. So that's going to be positive x in the middle, and then 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. And this will all equal 3x plus 13. Let's get 0 on one side. So let's subtract 3x from both sides. So we will now have x squared. Um, x minus 3x is negative 2x. And now let's subtract 13 from both sides. So this will be minus 15 is equal to 0. I'm sure this is going to end up factoring. A binomial times a binomial. x squared will only factor as x times x. 15 will either be 3 times 5 or 1 times 15. Let's go with 3 times 5. Inner plus outer must equal the middle. So we need a positive 3x in the middle, in the inner, and a negative 5x outer to make negative 2x. Also, positive 3 times negative 5 is negative 15. So we've done it. Setting each of these factors equal to 0 gives us x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 5. When we find ourselves uh, foiling and factoring, we often wind up with extraneous solutions. So let's check this very carefully. x equals negative 3 is going to be extraneous. Uh, if you plug in negative 3 here or here, you can tell that you're going to get a negative on the inside. For example, if I have negative 3 plus 2, that's negative 1. You cannot take the natural log of a negative number so this would be undefined. So we have to throw that one out, but x equals 5 uh, still works. So that is the only solution to number 22. Number 23, let's use the quotient rule to simplify the left-hand side. 
this would be the same as the log base 2 of 4x over x minus 2 is equal to 3. We need to somehow get x by itself, and we'll start by getting rid of the log base 2. We can do that by dropping a base 2 on both sides of the equation. On the left side, the base 2 and the log base 2 will cancel each other out, leaving behind 4x over x minus 2, which is equal to 2 to the third power, which is 8. Now, multiplying both sides by x minus 2 gives us 4x is equal to 8 times x minus 2. Distributing the 8 gives us 4x is equal to 8x minus 16. Let's subtract 8x from both sides. So that is going to give us negative 4x is equal to negative 16. Dividing both sides by negative 4 gives us x is equal to positive 4. On number 24, both sides of the equation can be rewritten with a base of 3. On the left side, 27 is 3 to the third power. So we have 3 to the third power, and then the negative 2x minus 1 will be multiplied in parentheses. Meanwhile, 1 over 9 is really 1 over 3 squared. But this is really 3 to the negative 2 power. So you see how we have base 3 on both sides. On the left side, let's distribute this 3. So we have negative 6x minus 3. And then when you raise a power to a power, you multiply. So we're going to multiply these two exponents. So that's 3 to the positive 4x power. Now, obviously, if we have base 3 on both sides, the exponents are going to have to equal each other. So negative 6x minus 3 must equal the 4x. If you wanted some type of an algebraic step, you could think of this as taking the log base 3 of both sides of the equation, but I find this to be unnecessary. Common sense really tells you that if both sides have a base 3, the only way this equation is valid is if the exponents are equal. But if you did take the log base 3 of both sides, this would cancel out the 3s and get you there. Back to algebra. Adding 6x to both sides gives us negative 3 is equal to 10x. And then dividing both sides by 10 gives us negative 3 over 10 is equal to x. Um, is this extraneous? Well, this, these aren't logarithms, so no, this is not extraneous. This is just fine. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but also if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link, which will take you to the whole unit playlist, or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.